Please, has anybody got any questions or clarification points or anything you want to ask the speakers? Great. So do get discussion. <laughs> Um, kia ora. Um, my name's Anna Nelson. I'm from Matawara Kia. We're an uh, addiction workforce development. And uh, my uh, question is around evidence or, in my sector, lack of evidence. And something you said, um, Stuart, around um, using evidence that has been created in one jurisdiction into another. So addiction... Specifically, I'll talk about the COPMIA work we're doing, which is working with children of parents... Um, who have mental illness and or addiction, and we've got quite a lot of mental health early interventions internationally, but they very little um, evidence around what works for um, children of parents with addiction. And so basically what I think we'll end up doing <laughs> is taking the evidence we've got for mental health internationally and hoping and crossing our fingers that that might actually work for addiction. And I've got huge concerns about that but in the absence of anything else, what do you suggest? Or is there a, any way of, um, or a framework of thinking about ha when you should cross jurisdictions or not? Yes, yeah, some thoughts on that would be really great. I, I suspect we're going to say the same thing. <laughs> you go. Well, there's implementation science, which is a whole... <laughs> emerging field of research which is just really about this and it's about frameworks for guiding the decision making so you know, Robert Milgram who we had out last year I think um, at a conference was introducing some of those frameworks and there's a there's a lot of work happening around this so it's about you know, not naively you know, adopting it in, in the most evidence based or widely cited international um, program but what's the fit within the context. You've got, you know, what was the thing and under what circumstances and the issue of scale, really. So um, there is the, you know, I'm happy to steer you in the direction of some of that work, but um, what's useful about it is it does help you take you through the steps that, that need to be considered. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah I, I would just agree with Jeremy, but to make it a little bit more concrete, if, if you suspect that there are programs that exist in New Zealand already that mm. might be effective. In my field, what, I've, what we often start off with is an audit, which is consistent with the approach Jeremy's proposing. We call it a profiling. We, we try and figure out where is it, whatever it is we're trying to achieve, where, it se where is it seemingly being done well? And then study the hell out of that, try and figure out what it is they're doing. And there are certain ways of doing that, and, but they boil down to having the discourse that, um, and the dialogue that uh, the team has been talking about, but with the people on the ground, so that you figure out, you make sense of, as I say, the intervention as currently might exist. So it's look, using the variability that exists and assuming that you already have capability of some sort, and then figuring out how it connects with what you know from the other jurisdictions to help design the most appropriate one. But that's where I would start. Um, just the, the nature of your question also, um, those of you at our conference quite recently may have heard Louise uh, Morpitz from um, Dartington um, Institute in the UK. Uh, she did, uh, did some lovely thing, uh, look at some of the uh, quite, quite large um, programs, particularly I think some of the parenting programs, Jeremy from Triple, Triple P and so on and so forth, and looked at uh, evaluating that under different contexts instead of just taking the evidence from other jurisdictions about what's effective. There were some really interesting um, results around some of those. So looking also at uh, their ways of doing that and thinking about that, I think would be really valuable. So that's another um, resource that you might want to tap into um, to get some ideas. And there was also some really interesting results they'd found about, um, in terms of implementation, the role of the practitioner. Um, and uh, some very, very interesting results showing how important um, that is. Um, so it, the evidence is showing that it's not just about 
rolling out the program uh, with full fidelity, fidelity of the program, it's also the role um, of the practitioner themselves in, in, rolling, in rolling that out. So those kinds of things, I, th I think, in thinking about some of that m may help influence you in, in thinking about what you do and how you take it on. I'm just interested if you have um, any experience in the use of um, outcomes measurement um, or PCOMs. Um, it's, uh, it's something that I've seen um, used in mental health services um, and uh, the, the work, it's been informed by some work by Scott Miller um, and we're um, basically um, a, question, a, a very quick kind of questionnaire is administered um, by the client following an intervention, um, just rating how successful the intervention was. And then that data can be aggregated at a person level um, to inform service sort of discussion about um, multidisciplinary team management, but can also be aggregated at a system level um, to look at actually how um, a, a particular service is, um, you know, dealing with particular groups of clients vis-a-vis -vis, uh, services and uh, other services. And it's very sort of... Um, it gives you, you know, quite instant time feedback instead of going through what can be a very long evaluation process. And I know that there's a quite a strong evidence base in the mental health um, field, but I think it is also being looked at in sort of social service settings. Um, I, I know that Wellesley Community Action are using it. So it just seems to me a really powerful way um, to have quite a lot of potential to get really good, um, you know, outcomes information, which is... Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, what, um, you know, you, you great minds, minds the size of planets have to... <laughs> um, yeah, I do, I do know a bit about PCOMs and I know um, that there are people that are using it and I've had a, a bit of a look at the, the evidence base around it. I, I see it more as a clinical management tool um, and, and it has value and it's proven value in that sense. I guess um, from an evaluation research point of view, if I put that hat on, um, I think it has limitations and we would need more evidence to be able to really do you know, a, a rigorous evaluation. But I think um, one of the things we, we talk about in the parenting report is not just evaluating for the sake of evaluation, but in a quality improvement, a test, I mean it's often referred to as, as, as test, learn, adapt. You know, if you have a culture where you are, you know, trying something out, you're getting some feedback, you're taking that on board and adapting your program, which most good programs have done, and often over quite a lengthy period, um, then that's the that's the context where I think that might be really useful. Pecom stuff. Yeah. And also, anybody from the audience that wants to chip in around that. <laughs> Uh, just reflecting on my piece of work on the accessibility of evidence and how we get it used. Um, given the time constraints of my piece of work, I, particularly in my background bias, I especially focused on the peer-reviewed academic literature. It's often hard to find out what people are doing if you don't know them already. Um, so things like Super Peru's Hub, where we're trying to make social sector research uh, readily available and create a portal for that is a really useful tool. Um, but it's something that I would sort of encourage the audience to think about. If you're doing great work, tell people about it. Hi, thank you very much for these presentations. They have certainly um, thought provoking and stimulating. I guess I'm asking a kind of more broader question is how is what Superu's role when it's coming up with evidence that maybe contradicts government policy or uh, MPs um, desires and you know what, what's your ability to be independent uh, from that sort of process? That, I mean that, that's actually a really an interesting question. And uh, so there are uh, some things um, that we um, 
do to uh, try and maintain um, independence. Um, one is particularly around the publications. So we publish everything, everything that we commission um, and everything that gets done in-house. Um, we don't get sign-off from our minister for that publication. Um, we uh, notify our minister um, and uh, we have a certain uh, number of days and it's if it's just um, for uh, her, it's two days. She gets it before we publish. Um, if it's uh, for other ministers and, and impacts on uh, other areas across the social sector, it's four days um, with the expectation that she forwards is, uh, what comes out um, onto, the, onto those um, ministries. So that, that's one thing that we do. Um, we have, uh, as Zoe mentioned, um, the hub, um, affectionately known as the hub, uh, and, and that's uh, part of our legislative mandate is to give access to um, government-funded um, research and evaluation. Um, so the hub creates a space where all of that comes together. Uh, it's basically a searchable um, database, uh, and uh, that will keep growing um, over time. The third thing um, that we have is a publishing protocol, um, and uh, the, we have the challenge of um, getting that used more broadly. Uh, if we look at what happens in the UK and some other countries, it's actually mandatory to publish um, the findings um, of government-funded research and evaluation. Uh, unfortunately, in New Zealand, we get, we get a lot that doesn't see the light of day. Um, and uh, particularly in, in times of risk averseness. Um, and and that's, that's a bit of a shame because I think all uh, pieces of work help to build the knowledge and the understanding, even if it's a failure, even if we find something actually doesn't work. Um, and so that's, the I guess, the kind of culture and um, uh, the, the kinds of things um, that, that we do. The messages we're getting really loud and clear at the moment is that government does want to be challenged. They seriously do want to know about what's working and what's not. Uh, I don't know whether you've heard the Minister English speak. He talks about um, <coughs> the idea with uh, families with complex needs of having you know 12 cars parked up the driveway and, and they've got no idea what's effective and what's not and too scared to pull one of the cars out of the driveway in case it's the thing that's actually uh, keeping the whole thing together and, and not really being able to understand that. Uh, you probably heard Minister Tolly quite recently um, on TV talking about the fact that really they don't know um, about a lot of, of, of what is going on and the services that are being delivered and how effective they are. So there is, at the moment, I think, for all of us here in this room, a really ideal opportunity to be thinking about the role of evidence and to be um, taking it quite seriously in, um, you know, in what, what kind of change that we can bring about at the moment because, as you know, these things ebb and flow. So uh, we see it as a great opportunity at the moment. And I'll just add as well that in terms of the integrity of our publications is that, you know, if it's a significant piece of work, then we will always go out to external peer review and to at least two or three um, others who are, have expertise in the field as well. So that's something else that we do. Hi, there. And I'll, I'll just add, that, sorry, the last bit there. We have a social science experts panel. So there, there are there's some things about the way Superu operates that um, have some of that you know, we're wanting to draw on that external academic expertise. And, that, and in fact, you know, in, in the coming year, that's one of the big pieces of work that we'll be doing is because, as Gail said, Minister English is interested in, we have this resource within academia, and, and to what extent are we able to draw on it to use in the, in the policy development? Oh, hi. Um, Margaret Pack from Australian Catholic University in Sydney. Um, I've just recently helped social work practitioners edit a book on evidence-based practice. And what we found in editing that book is social workers often don't follow the, the hierarchy of evidence, as you might gather. And um, one of the things social workers do, they work in areas where they're bringing together and coordinating, where there might not be much information. 
and then really the onus is on bringing that gap in knowledge to the awareness of the authorities. The other, the other area is um, bringing together policy and seeing where the gaps are in terms of policy provision. Um, and that was particularly so for child protection and youth justice chapters. So um, I think social workers approach the, the search for evidence a bit differently from the conventional um, hierarchy of evidence. I'm just wondering uh, if you had any comments about that or? Well, um, uh, I mean, I think, I th and I think it's what Stuart's saying as well, the capability of workers and practitioners is incredibly important. <laughs> um, and, and definitely, as I talked about the implementation science, well, one of the things that the implementation science is doing is, is following up uh, after workers have been trained to see whether they actually put into practice what they've been trained at. And in most cases, they don't. You know, they, um, and, and so what are the things that we can do to support them to, you know, to to have good practice, and that's partly about organisational support, system support, um, and, and the type of training that's undertaken. So, um, I, you know, I just think that really is incredibly important. Uh, you can have the best program in the world <laughs> um, on paper, but, you know, if it's poorly implemented by unsupported, untrained workers, then yeah, no hope. Probably because a lot of social workers think on their feet, they think searching for evidence will take too much time, and they don't have the time and they're under pressure and that Well, time. yeah, and that's why we, I mean, Gail can talk about that, but we try and have different, pri you know, I come from the academic side of things, so, you know, I'm, I'm used to reading big lengthy reports, so people don't have time to do that. So, you know, you have to package that knowledge in different ways. Do you want to talk about that, Gail? Um, what it actually brings to mind, the, the New Zealand police are, are currently working at um, how they push evidence right down to the ground level so that uh, when police are making judgments and, and as you wear they have to make quite a few judgments uh, across a whole variety of different areas um, that they are making evidence informed judgments um, now I haven't been intimately involved in that but I think um, <coughs> it, you know it speaks to to what you're talking about uh, about getting um, getting that evidence thinking right down um, to the ground um, so that it's actually helping uh, inform practitioners in, in when they make those um, judgments uh, across time, in time. Yeah. Stuart, have you got any thoughts? For what it's worth, uh, in educational context, and maybe Brian can help us here, um, what matters is whether or not the evidence addresses the questions that are most pertinent to the person on the ground. Now some of our meta-analyses and summaries aren't all that useful. So the, the trick for me is, is to get evidence and data that inform the questions that are the, you know, the urgent questions on the ground. Now you know, teachers mostly are interested in, in, in evidence that's diagnostic as well as, uh, as well as summative to help them make their judgments. They will use expert sort of academic um, literature to the extent that it's mediated, this is the translation issue uh, by partners, but, but, the, but the, as it were, the, the strength and the connection between the sort of evidence that you want to act and, and the evidence that you've actually got is, is the issue to me. I think it's sometimes um, because of the different cultures that exist within disciplines too, because um, I think with social workers they tend to kind of go into one another's offices and talk out options and look for evidence that way. So it's sort of like an oral tradition. And it's how, you know, you can align that with a more formal search. Um, but GPs, I think, function in the same way um, from reading the literature. They well, often don't systematically search. I think there's a source of evidence that is often glossed over or is, or is harder to collect, certainly in an educational context, and that's the evidence about practice. And we don't, for various structural reasons, have very good systems in New Zealand for sharing effective practice at a, at a class or school or inter-school level. And 
that part we need smarter tools, um, smarter ways of, of uh, gathering useful evidence about the practices that impact on yeah. the diagnostic, formative, summative sorts of things. I think we've got a couple of minutes left. So last last question. Kia ora. Oh. Paul Fitanui um, from the University of Otago College of Education. Just, la just uh, thanks for the presentation and it's really insightful. It's not often I come to a, a developmental or human developmental co conference of this nature, but um, this is the second one, so it's been really insightful. Um, I guess I get, from my perspective in terms of uh, my areas in Māori studies and teacher education and focuses on Māori education more broadly, but um, the language that gets that seems to be coming through seems to always reposition Māori Pacifica back in the same position, often, most of the time. So just, uh, there was a couple of words that came up like um, targeting Māori and Pacifica, um, capability, and there seems to be, uh, you know, Am ambiguities in the language that's used. So I'm just wondering, sometimes when you when you talk about those questions, who poses those questions? Um, who who's actually saying that benefits the group that's involved? And also, who deserves to know about the information that's being disseminated? It's actually the first time I've heard of Subur, um, and I'm in education. I'm I, I, I class myself as relatively well read, but uh, and at the end of the day, I, I still don't. I don't see the connections being made on the ground. So, um, so maybe where the, where the information's been disseminated, the multiple programs, um, it seems to be an ongoing problem of just what you're saying, Stuart, of getting that actual data and evidence to where it needs to be. And maybe the questions aren't being asked by the right people. And so that we get the same ongoing, we get the status quo, and we can't, we'll be back here 20 years talking about the same, same issues. So I, so what we've decided, well, the position we've taken, I've taken in my own research, is to just keep it small. Start with your community, um, have, find out, build that relationship. It's taken me a year to build a relationship with my community, to understand the whanau's needs and aspirations for education, and then come back to the research and say, well, what can that inform us? Is there anything else? And then we start to ask the questions and, and emerge our understanding about what needs to happen at the community level. Because our communities are the ones that are really suffering this, so they need to be at the heart of the decision making, as opposed to being top down. When it comes to Māori and Pacifica, we're normally the fourth on the run. The information is devolved to us, it's not actually we're in front of it del delivering and saying, as a bicultural nation, this is what we should be doing. So it's really a comment that I feel quite passionate about, and, um, and, and with all the right intentions, but I just think sometimes uh, the language that's been used repositions us back to where we in the status quo. So I don't know if there's any answer to that. <laughs> well, that's a question, but I just felt I needed to say that. So kia ora. Thank, thank you, and those are, those are really um, valid um, comments, because I think all of us come from our own cultural lenses and, and our own experiences, so I think that's really valid. Um, I would, what it did trigger for me, perhaps, was the um, family and whanau um, wellbeing report that Super has released today and in there very clearly um, it demonstrates that, that when we think about well-being, it's not the same. Um, it does depend upon your cultural lens and, and what your experience is and, and what it means, uh, and, and that can be very different things, which I think speaks to um, some, of the, some of the comments that you're making. Um, so thank you.